everybody to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast, and I'm your host, Olivia Fierro, in our Phoenix studio with Margaret Stewart, our podcast producer, who's going to share some interesting book recommendations a little bit later on, but I got to get to this. I am so excited for our guest today. Time Magazine listed The Other Black Girl among the most anticipated books of the year, and upon its release on June 1st, it immediately became an instant New York Times bestseller. This is a debut novel, by the way. So Zakia Dalila Harris is joining us to talk about the book that has had everyone talking. And I mean, first off the bat, OMG, congratulations. You are just, you, you still have to be floating on cloud nine. I am, I am. Thank you so much, Olivia. I'm so excited to be chatting with you today. Um, I can't believe I'm chatting with you today still. Like every single conversation, everything I read, it's still so much. I can't believe it. I'm just so excited. I don't know if you would have time to become a scrapbooker, but you need to have some intense <laughs> scrapbooking skills because your name is everywhere and this incredible cover is everywhere. <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm I'm obsessed with the cover too. Oh. Obsessed. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so okay, so I, I always want to make sure that when we're when we're talking to our fabulous authors that I'm not trying to do any spoilers. We're trying to get everybody to be reading all of these books. And of course many are gonna have already read this since it was the top of the list for so many people <laughs> the second that it came out. But give me because a lot has been spoken about how it's genre bending. So give me what your pitch or your little quickie elevator pitch would have been because it there there yeah. are so many surprises. It's like how do you communicate that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I have a few different pitches, but I usually call it a, a horror-tinged workplace a social thriller. <laughs> so all, all of the things in one um, about uh, a young Black woman who is struggling to succeed um, in the very white world of book publishing. Um, and of course, so Nella Rogers is the protagonist. She's been the only one at her prestigious publishing house for the last few years. So when Hazel, another Black woman, shows up she's delighted she's like great we're going to have our our black girl bonding moment we can have all these conversations about our co-workers our, our white co-workers who are pretty clueless in a lot of ways um but a series of uh disturbing unsettling things happen in the office and nella starts to question her relationship with hazel and of course her relationship with everybody at work so there's a little paranoia, there's a little bit of, am I crazy, what's going on here, and then a twist, and there's just <laughs> everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah, there's layer upon layer of feelings and things going on, right, and and yeah. self-doubt, and um, yes. many, uh, of course this is about, about race and about um, representation or, 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 or not having, you know, community within your community and learning to fit into yes. certain spaces, which, you know, could be a woman working in a male dominated field or, or vice versa yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. also about that self doubt that I think young women or young people have in their careers also, where we just sure. want to fit in and stand out and show potential or get approval. And Nella is struggling for that big time. Totally, totally. I mean, we are constantly young people, young women, young women of color. We're constantly trying to check every single box um, because we feel like we have to be exactly. We have to stand out, but we also want to blend in. We also don't want to rock the boat too much. And all of those things are intense just for anybody, um, I think, who's trying to get into an industry that is really hard to get into, like publishing. But definitely extends to a lot of industries, unfortunately. Um, but then it's also hard for, for Nella because she has, again, all of those kind of expectations she feels like she needs to meet just as a young person of putting in all the work, kind of, you know, uh, sacrificing her social life and maybe her well-being to, to be the Black editor that Wagner Books doesn't have. Um, all of those things, but then also, of course, not wanting to come off too pushy, being the, the angry black woman, um, not wanting to be too sensitive. So all of those things can be really hard to do, but also can be terrifying when you've worked so hard and things don't quite pan out the way that you expected them to pan out. Well, so Hazel just breezes in, and, and let me just tell you, you hooked me so ridiculously with the description right away of the moments when she senses Hazel's presence. And it's all about literally 
scent and and, mm, and yes. knowing that it, the quote is she, when she realizes quote there was another black girl on the 13th floor so that aroma of the cocoa butter and the yeah. hair product immediately it's such a sensory thing and also that cubicle life experience that we're yes. you're dealing with a lot in a, a common space mm -hmm. that must have been very much pulled pulled from your experience working oh for sure for sure um i started writing chapter one the very first part of the book i ever wrote in my cubicle actually mm -hmm. so i was channeling what it's like to be in that kind of space where suddenly you know i mean you can't see what's going on everyone can see you in a lot of ways before you can see them um but also you're picking up on what's going on around you just from smells and by what the footsteps you hear right you can tell who's passing your desk by that so i really wanted to play with that and and really expl uh, explore what that means for someone like nella who's been craving that kind of contact her entire time being at Wagner Books. But sadly for Nella, the immediate bonding that she would have laid out doesn't really happen. It, it, there's a very yes. interesting dynamic right away. But one of the things about Hazel is that she just seems to be better at all of the stuff than Nella, fitting, <laughs> in, sta fitting in and standing out simultaneously. Yes, yes, definitely. And a lot of the push pull in the book, um, I mean, I, I don't think this is giving too much away. It's just Nella navigating how much of it is Hazel's actually succeeding and doing better than she is, or how much of it is Nella just not confident and not secure with, you know, speaking out or, or being uh, more vocal about things. And so that also, as, as someone who personally, I am also an overthinker, um, I'm a lot like Nella in a lot of ways, um, that can be also really daunting to have someone else, especially someone of color who you imagined would be an ally. Um, and we're hoping, you know, you could grow together or help them show them the way because you were there first, but then suddenly you're no longer longer the one um, and for her it's also exacerbated by the fact that Hazel is this kind of put together blackness that Nella has never been yeah it's um she, she almost and then Nella kind of flashes back as she's look observing the way that Hazel navigates work and she kind of remembers almost the way that she sold herself when she was coming into the publishing business and is she sort of did she sort of lose sight of the way that she was presenting herself or kind of playing the role that they were hiring her for? She also is sort of finding her identity or, or kind of um, feeling her identity out in her relationship and also in her personal friendship. So she's sort of always been used to maybe being the other, and she's almost like kind of learning how to become a black woman and what it means to herself at that time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because uh, it's important to note Nella grew up in mostly white environments as a young person. So that was really what she knew. And uh, what we were talking about earlier about, you know, really assimilating for her, the stakes were even higher as a young person, because she knew she was different. She knew there are a lot of things about her that, you know, did not blend in with everybody else. And so she, of course, takes those skills and thinks that th they will be what she needs at Wagner and um, to of course have the other the other thing happen of okay well you know even though you've been here for so long there's this other person here who um and i mean i again trying to dance around spoilers, <laughs> but it's just a different level of you know um the way they hold themselves together and the ways in which hazel responds to things very differently than nella does <laughs> yes, they they certainly do. They were, they they handle everything very differently. You you in your in your writing, you're also bringing in two other women who had been part of the Wagner Publishing earlier in another time period, and there are uh, connections there. Um, and there's also a major suspenseful, surprising twist that has been you know alluded to a lot in t in talking about this book. Was that initially part of this? plan for your book or was it just going to be um i don't even know how how to phrase it how much change from when you started out to to what we're reading 
Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, so when I first started writing the book, I was really interested in Nella and Tazel and the ways in which they are, you know, meeting in this very white workplace and what that means for them. Um, but I also knew that part of what would keep Nella at this job was something that similarly kept me in publishing, which was working in a place where, um, I mean, I worked at Penguin Random House, and I knew that Toni Morrison had worked um, at Random House many years earlier and had been published um, also at Penguin Random House. And so for me, I often looked back to her as this person who was doing it during a time that was way harder than I I was doing it. Um, I mean, it's all relative, uh, as you see in the book too. And, and so I knew that would be part of what really drove Nella, is knowing that Kendra Ray had been at Wagner Books um, many years earlier. So that was living in Nella's head in my first iteration of the book. But then I just wrote it all through Nella's point of view because I felt like I really need to get her story out there. And then afterwards, I went back and I started writing um, the other sections with Kendra Ray and Diana and Shawnee. I want to talk about the the writing process for you. This is your first novel. I mean, the the accolades that this book has received, the, the sales, the all of it, is just wild for anybody, even wilder when you're talking debut novel, especially coming from publishing. You also know what lightning in a bottle looks like. And, and yeah. so did you, did you have a feeling, did you allow yourself to feel that this was going to happen with this book? I didn't. I didn't. Um, like I said a little bit earlier, like I'm very much like Nella in terms of kind of being very careful. And I mean, when I quit, so I did quit my job in publishing to, to write this book and I'd started it. Um, I'd spent like maybe three months on it. And then I left because I was like, you know, I didn't need to see this through. And I did tell people that I was quitting actually to finish a book, which like looking back on it, I can't believe I did that. Um, but I think also part of me knew that that would help me um, because I wanted to prove like, you know, I, I, I knew that I needed to finish this book no matter what. Um, and so I definitely, you know, would talk to people about the idea and people were into it and, you know, people had so much fun talking about this idea of these two women um, working in this place in this kind of genre lens. But I definitely kept you know, kept my expectations pretty low because I know also how many wonderful books and uh, proposals I'd read working in publishing and knowing we couldn't buy all of them because there are so many other factors. Maybe um, we bought a book like this last year or maybe the timing, all of those things go into it. So I definitely had my, my publishing brain on um, in order to kind of manage expectations. So it was in the reverse. It was just so amazing to have publishing respond to the book uh, the way they did because I was also of course nervous nervous <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it of course it's it's depicting an environment where people are not necessarily um in incredibly aware of what right. Nella is experiencing as being you know right. one of the only black members of the staff or the only one until Hazel arrives and the sensitivities are not as heightened as you would hope this intellectual set would be <laughs> where they would yes. be right yes right and it was also I mean at the time, so we, my agent and I were shopping the book around um, last February, March of 2020. Uh, so there are still conversations about representation happening. I mean, there are always waves of, um, unfortunately, police misconduct, police um, shootings, all of those things. But this was before, of course, last summer. So it wasn't the same conversation that we're now having, right, about actual change. I mean, I am hoping that it will be actual, actual change when people are back in the office, but I do feel like there has been a little bit of progress made just in the last year of putting everything out on the table and speaking more openly about what it's like to be the only one. Is there some, a powerful moment when Nella is kind of reeling emotionally from, from reading in, in the news and, and being immersed in yes. uh, the shooting of a black man, and she's, she, she feels like, you know, she's going through, like, a world shift. It's uh, something emotional and catastrophic that she's coping with, and she's going yeah. out into the public and going into her workspace and realizes nobody shares this experience with me. This yeah. happened. They know, but they don't yes. feel anything about it. 
Yeah, yes. And that was coming from, uh, I mentioned the waves, that was coming from the, the wave for, uh, 2015, 2016. Um, I had just moved to Brooklyn a couple years earlier, and Eric Garner had happened um, in Staten Island, and there were protests everywhere. And that moment for me, I started my MFA program in nonfiction. Um, that moment for me caused my own kind of awakening um, in terms of who I am as a young Black woman who also grew up in mostly white spaces. And I just remember at the time I was working in a pie shop um, in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and a very Brooklyn place to work, um, pie coffee shop. And I had just seen the video of Philando Castile um, being murdered in his car with his family. Um, and then I had to go to work and serve people pie. And it was the most like disturbing day because I had gone from being in my apartment holed up with all of these feelings and then having to pretend like the world is just continuing which of course it does but it's hard to do that as a as a young person and so ever since that moment um i've been thinking about that about what it means to be black in this country and really have to decide how much you're going to uh, tune into things how involved you're going to be and i had that same kind of thing happen last year when i was working on edits of uh, the other black girl and the world was protesting. I was protesting. It was a difficult time and you know, wondering if this book is, what's the point kind mm -hmm. of things, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and I really channeled um, a lot of what I was experiencing and the grief I was feeling into some of those scenes of going back and, and really making sure that, that my message was conveyed and just this, the, the weight, the weight that we have to navigate with every day. Yeah, I think that there's a probably a profound sense of loneliness that mm -hmm. happens when you have to put on that face for, for the world when you feel that yes. the world should actually be in the space emotionally where you are. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, if you have advice for somebody who is aspiring to, uh, I don't know, you know, have a star trajectory and a debut <laughs> novel that is going to get all of the things and be named all of the things and um, on and on, uh, where do they sit down and how do they start? I mean, it's just, it is, it seems, I mean, it's a dream for so many and those of us who love to read fantasize about having a story to tell. Where do you begin? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I think I think it begin, begins on the page. I think it begins on the page of making sure you are just focusing on the story. And this is advice for me, too, that I'm thinking of with my next book in terms of, you know, I, I have, I often think forward and ahead and think about all the things that could happen and know all the things and trajectories the book could go. But it's really important to just sit down and just, put it out there, put out that draft, and then share it with someone um, if you feel, feel comfortable doing that. Um, opening up your, your bubble and getting your work out there so that people are looking at it early can be nice. It can give you a confidence boost. It can also give you a little direction. So, so I really think just trusting yourself and going with the story and just living in those words first and foremost is the most important thing, and reading. Reading as well. Reading for sure. Uh, I I think I read. I think it was in an inter interview magazine. You were talking about how you sit down and when you when you've got a deadline or you're working on something. And I thought, well, I could really be friends with this girl because he, <laughs> he, to get out of your own way, you sometimes have to sit down with like a gin and tonic or whatever. It seemed yes. it seemed very loose, yes. like the way that you're going about things, which is you know makes it makes it authentic and fun. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's what I like to say. I'm like. It is it, you know, a problem for me to have a drink every now and then? I, I thought about, I appreciate that. Because <laughs> I did wonder, I was like, if people want to think, it's like, you know what, this is my process. That's another tip. Trust your process. Trust your process. <laughs> Whatever you can do to tap into that creative genius you may or may not have, as long as you can still spell, then good for yes. you. <laughs> Speaking of uh, reading, um, I always try to ask the, our novelists that we have the opportunity to speak to about when they really clicked into loving stories and understanding the magic of books because I guess that's yeah. really where where you are right now begins with that moment definitely definitely Oh, I mean, I loved reading as a kid uh, that was always something that my parents were both very much uh, 
insistent upon us doing. So, I mean, I read Harry Potter with my mom as a young person when those first came out. Um, before I'd heard, I remember getting it as a gift and not having heard of the books, which is wild looking back on it. Um, but yeah, I loved Goosebumps. Um, I loved um, the Animorph series. I liked a lot of horror and kind of off the beaten path books. But then I also loved Meg Cabot. <laughs> um, I loved uh, Sarah Dessen, um, those stories about young women finding themselves those really spoke to me so I was kind of all over the place um and I think that's the thing it's like as long as you're reading a lot of different things too I think that that's really important different genres different um types of writers different just diverse backgrounds um and the authors you're choosing I think that's really important too and that's really definitely influenced all the things I put into this book I had the pleasure with this book of bouncing back and forth between the audio and the book, oh, which is God, such yeah. a ugh. talk <laughs> so to good. me about the audio and the casting and finding out who's voicing this. And then when you're actually listening to your words delivered in that capacity, it must be just other level. Yeah, I mean, I I told myself after I did all the copy edits and went back to copy edits, like there are a lot of a lot of rounds of editing because there's there's a lot there's just a lot in the book. Um, I was like, I'm never gonna read this book again. <laughs> I was like, I'm never gonna read this story again. And then the audio came, um, the finished audio, and I was like, okay, well, I'll just listen to a little bit. And then I listened to the whole thing. I was like, oh my so god, good. because it feels so different from the book in a lot of ways, at least for me, because I've spent, I haven't spent that much time with this story. It's been two years, a little more than two years since I started writing it, but it still feels fresh. And I just remember uh, last summer, I got an email from my team at Simon & Schuster, uh, the audio team, about people they were thinking for each of the characters. And to see all of those names, um, Asia Naomi King, Oh my goodness, buddy's so coming. Good. It's just they're all so good and they all bring something so unique and pure and thoughtful to the story. And I just am so honored that they took the time to do it and they did it so well. Um, and to have my words be acted out in that way uh, is just so surreal and it's it's just an amazing feeling. Oh, it's incredible. And it it almost you you hear that delivery and then I would find myself going back and rereading reading what I had just heard and, and vice versa because mm -hmm. it's it's a really it was a really immersive experience. It was extremely enjoyable to to be able to dig into the book Thank that way. You. Obviously this will become a movie, right? <laughs> or series. A TV show. Television a TV, series. Okay. Yeah. It's in the works. It's in the works. <laughs> will you be very involved in that? Yes, I'm actually uh, co-writing right now uh, the pilot with Rashida Jones. Oh, so it's yes. for Hulu. Yeah, it's been it's been so much fun. It's definitely a new, just all new territory for me. I'm watching a lot of TV for homework, so like it could be worse, right? <laughs> um, but I'm having a lot of fun just thinking about a little more of the story, a little more of the characters that we don't get to see in the book because you can only do so much in a book, but now it's like outfits and music and, and hair and conversations that we didn't get to, to put um, in the book. So I'm really excited. Uh, I can't wait. And speaking of music, I wanted to mention, I think it's the coolest thing and I hope that publishing houses keep doing this or I don't know if it yes. came straight from you you know what I'm talking about the Spotify playlist what I do I do yeah well it's funny my publicist um emailed me about it earlier this year um asking you know hey like would you want to maybe make a playlist and I was like what I want to make a playlist I've already had one up here in my head for the last like ever since <laughs> That's I started waiting writing for you it. to ask yeah I love I love music um uh it's it's one of my favorite things in the world like I can spend so much time going down rabbit holes with music and so uh I very quickly I mean I was able to come up with the songs very easily I actually had to make sure I didn't have too long of a playlist because <laughs> there's just so many so many ways I could go with it each character is so different and so so unique oh I hope that some of this music would be making its way into the television series because it's just yes. so good and then the of course <laughs> appearance randomly of nine to five I mean it just yes. it just has to it has to <laughs> I love I love that song it's I, so I, good <laughs> Dolly Parton had to get a little had to get a little shout out on this playlist <laughs> everybody loves Dolly Parton it doesn't matter yes. what you're no, what you're typically listening to everybody yes. loves Dolly <laughs> yes 
Yes, so much earnestness. <laughs> oh, well, Zakia, it has been an absolute pleasure and delight to be able to speak with you. And I was so mm-hmm. excited to read this book. And we immediately asked us to be able to talk to you whenever you are going to be available. Um, so I am so happy that you're on a fantastic wild ride. And um, thank you so mm-hmm. much for all the surprises. Oh, thank you so much, <laughs> Olivia. This has been such a delight. I, I really appreciate you reading and, and having me. Thank you. Looking forward to more coming from you since this is just the <laughs> debut, just the beginning. Imagine that. Yes, wow. yes. It's wonderful and also a little daunting, but mostly <laughs> wonderful. No pressure, no pressure, no Zakia. Pressure. You know, we just expect all of this to happen one more time yeah. and then again. Yes. <laughs> that is Zakia Delilah Harris. The book is The Other Black Girl. Um, go out and get it now. Don't be left out of this conversation. Everybody is talking about it. And then do the playlist. And then we'll wait for Hulu. Zakia, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Zakia Dalila Harris. Now that was a treat because immediately when I even read about this book, I knew we really wanted to talk to her for this podcast, which yeah. was super cool. You came up to me, or I came up to you probably, and you said, oh, we have to have her on the podcast. You'd read maybe a quarter of the book. You weren't even like, a quarter down, anyway. finished the book already. And you're like, I really love this book. You have to read it. I'm going to request to have her on the podcast. And sure enough, I mean, It was a really great book. And, you know, there was an interview that we're not going to talk spoilers. I I think we've mentioned it on the podcast before about, you know, taking a look at a book in in its just single entirety and and instead of comparing it to others. Yes. And ever since hearing her in that interview talk Mm -hmm. about some of the specifics of the book, Mm -hmm. which we won't talk about right now, ever since seeing that or hearing that, it makes me think, of books in a whole other way. Trying to be more open-minded yeah. because I, I guess I'll get very into something and if it doesn't go exactly down the path that I'm anticipating, right. I'm frustrated, mm-hmm. which is absurd because I'm the passenger on this ride and right. I'm the driver. Yeah. And so we are trying to be the driver <laughs> right? every time. And that's you you can't do and you're robbing yourself of being on kind of uh, on the wild unpredictable ride that is a yeah. good book. So, um and just I'm committed to being careful to not spoil this book for anybody. Yes. So um, I do highly recommend it. And I just think it has – there's a lot to take away to, to um, talk about, just about race and about di- dynamics at work oh, and about yeah. um, all, all the kinds of stuff. So you'll have these conversations with whomever's in your life that you share this book with definitely, and the audio was great. It was amazing. So let's just talk about something that we – what what book have you loved recently? So and by recently it's probably like five minutes ago because you, you're. I mean, I'm stuff. constantly reading, right. as we know. I had the absolute pleasure of having an audiobook version of "We Are the Brennans." Oh, I have. So thank you very much, Net Galley, by mm-hmm. the way. And so oh, for yeah. those of you who are not um, in this literary space that we've somehow trying to wedge our booties into, <laughs> Net Galley is the most amazing thing in the world that's happened to me in a long time. Oh, yeah. Um, where they're letting you preview these books even before they come out so right. that you're ready to review them or blog about them or do the interviews. And so um, it's been amazing. I mean, there's the audio books and mm-hmm. digital copies. And so, yes, I've got this this loaded as an audio as well. I haven't started it yet. So I just finished. Ooh. And I'm very excited about it because – I was thinking about it. I listened to it as an audiobook. I was driving home from work yesterday and hearing a piece of it and thinking, you know, the writing isn't dynamic. It's not super detail oriented. It's not going into the depths of describing a particular scene, but it is simplistic in a way that it's so beautiful that and it's this this whole family, Irish Catholic family dynamic. And the lengths they go to, you know, keep keep a secret, Mm -hmm. not only of themselves, but of each other and what they would go through to make sure that that tight knit family stays tight. Mm -hmm. And it's it reminded me a lot of Such a Fun Age, which is similarly based. But um, I really, really enjoyed it. Yay. Yeah. And I believe it's a Reese's Book Club or uh, is it Book of the Month? It's one of those like. Very high-profile yeah. 
books. Um, I So I wasn't expecting it. And sometimes those books don't really thrill me as mm-hmm. much as everybody is all about them. So I a little concerned that it wasn't going to be as good, but I just loved it. And maybe because I'm Irish and Catholic. Oh, yeah. Of Irish. I'm not from Ireland, obviously. <laughs> you really overcame that accent yeah, quickly. Yeah, man. <laughs> I wish I actually had it. I love it. Yes, but um, Okay, and is that even out yet? Do we know? You know, I don't think well, that who knows? it is. And maybe not listening to this podcast on the day, of course, that we're that we're talking. But um, I can't remember if it's more of a late summer release or an early summer release. I think it's a summer release. And in, I actually misspoke about the other book that it reminded me of. It's Ask Again, Yes. Ask Again, Yes. Not mm-hmm. such a funny age. Such a funny age. Mm-hmm. Completely different. Ask Again, Yes is a very similar, like, Irish families and neighbors being super intertwined. Mm-hmm. So that's the book that it reminded me of. So I misspoke. I'm sorry about that. But I believe this book, um, if it's not out already, I'm fairly certain it is. So anyway, it'll be out by the time you hear this. All right. It will be out. <laughs> Run. So, follow yes. that recommendation. Definitely. Yes. Okay, so I will say something that I have just completed that I really enjoyed. And the release date of this is September 7th, 2021. And it's called Fault Lines by oh, yeah. Emily Itami. And I listened to this on audio. Thank you, Ned Galley. And I didn't hear anything about it. To be honest, mm-hmm. I just thought the cover was pretty. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the, just sometimes like, the best way to pick. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I guess we're not alone. I've always felt like very vapid about being drawn yeah. to books for a cover. But clearly it's a thing because on NetGalley, they also, when you request a book, they ask why you're requesting it. Yeah. Is it because you're familiar with the author? Because you've heard a lot of buzz about the book? Um, you know, yada, yada. And also one of the options is because cover. you like the cover. I always click cover. So, well, yes. Mm-hmm. And... So this was surprising. I didn't really have any knowledge of it going in or expectations, but I knew that it was set in Tokyo and it was, yeah. um, you know, the kind of angsty story of a married woman who, you know, is is feeling <laughs> like she needs to stretch her wings or break out of this shell of, of, of her lifestyle that she's fallen into. And I know that that's a story that's being told a lot right now, or mm-hmm. at least it is in the books that I've been gravitating towards. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. I can't get enough of it. And this one is beautifully written it is beautiful to listen to and i'm also very just obsessed with japan i know you've traveled to japan i have oh watching the olympics like this is so high on my list of of next big trip yeah that it kind of i loved being taken there and this mizuki is our protagonist and she's a a mother that is a very traditional tokyo housewife with Mm -hmm. two children but she also is unusual because she spent time in the states so she speaks english she speaks some french and so she has um more of a wild side Mm. that is now being contained in this you know very kind of rigid lifestyle they're very conservative very in, in different aspects like even in talks with the olympics they were talking about how athletes are showing their tattoos and tattoos are still very much Mm -hmm. not a thing to be showing off in Japan. Mm -hmm. A lot of water parks won't allow you if you have visible tattoos, Mm -hmm. even if they're really small. So yes, very conservative in a lot of aspects Mm -hmm. still, very traditional. And I think that insight into those cultural dynamics Mm -hmm. and those expectations are really interesting to come from an American perspective. So I love this and I loved just this this woman and this Mizuki she it, one of the first scenes where you kind of get her complexity is that she's describing her absolutely gorgeous apartment and it's all the details about how beautiful and the views and basically you're they're very you know up, upper scale family and she's out on one of her many balconies looking out <laughs> over the beautiful city oh, views darn. Right? and this is where this is the balcony where she plays a little game with herself where she kind of flings her leg over the um over the railing to kind of scare herself into thinking, oh, I'm about to fall and then hope to have the um, natural instinct to save herself so that she'll realize, okay, she does feel like living and she does feel like going on with her life. And then sometimes she goes out on that patio and just screams. And then sometimes she goes out on that patio and secretly smokes. So she does all of these like secret things (laughs) because she has like a little like rebellious thing going. Yeah. And she, that's her outlet. Yeah. But so she's a trip. I mean, you're always like laughing out loud because it's like everything is super perfect but then of course it's not and her husband is very frustrating and and 
Uh, her kids are adorable, but whatever. And she wanted to be a singer. And, of course, she meets this other man. And so there was so much oh, to boy. it. Um, I absolutely loved it. So hopefully we'll be able to speak to this author as well because I thought it, it was – I almost thought it was a translation as well because it seems so um, – it, 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 it just puts you right there. Involved. Yes. And it turns out, I, I looked at the author, and I believe that she is Japanese but now lives in, in England. So she, she wrote the book in English. And so um, it How was. Fun. But I, I was I was very much enjoyed it. So that is called Fault Lines, Emily Atami, and it's early September release. I'm going to tell you, for you, Olivia, and anyone listening, if you've not been to Tokyo and it was not ever really on your list, it never really was truly on my oh list my as a traveler. God. I always wanted to do Europe first, mm -hmm. right? Nope. My One of my best friends moved to Japan for a while, a couple of years, and I went to visit her with my sister. Mm -hmm. And that by far has been the, mm. the most dynamic trip I've ever taken. And everyone in Tokyo and in Japan that I've come across, so kind, so loving. So lovely. And just trying to understand you. Oh, I could talk forever about Japan. Oh, I need to go there. So this, yeah. And then when you when you read a book where it's at some place and you already have the itch. Wanderlust. Oh, oh, oh for seriously. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then also, of course, Australia. You've been to Australia too, right? I have been to Australia. So I haven't been there either. And now that's high on my list because we have so many of the authors we love living there. We could yes. Go, we could go and try to show up. I know. <laughs> Sally Hepworth, hey, Sally. what's going what's on? What's going on? Do you know where Leanne Moriarty lives? Yeah. <laughs> Should we go say hi? Bring her some tea. I know it's a big, I know it's a big country, but are you guys neighbors or what? Yeah, it is a very large country. <laughs> so these are the tangents that interesting books will send you on, Absolutely. and you know the conversations are limitless. So, uh, Margaret, this was a very good moment with Margaret. It's We Are the Brennans. That's your recommendation. Yes. And well, who's the author? Tracy Lane. Tracy Lane, and I've got Fault Lines. Emily Itami, and our guest today was Zakia Delila Harris, the other black girl. Amazing. Awesome day. Go back to your books. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. We want to hear from you, so send us an email to Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com. Let us know what you're reading and check out the Olivia's Book Club Facebook group, or you can follow along on Instagram at olivias.bookclub or Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and please tell your friends.